Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for the virtual Vertica BDC 2020. Today's breakout session is entitled Migrating Your Vertica Cluster to the Cloud. I'm Jeff Healy, and I lead Vertica Marketing. I'll be your host for this breakout session. Joining me are Sumit Kizwani and Chris Daly, Vertica product technology engineers and key members of our customer success team. Before we begin, I encourage you to submit questions or comments during the virtual session. You don't have to wait. Just type your question or comment in the question box below the slides and click submit. As always, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We'll answer as many questions we're able to during that time. Any questions that we don't address, we'll do our best to answer them offline. And alternatively, you can visit Vertica Forms at forum.vertica.com to post your questions there after the session. Our engineering team is planning to join the forums to keep the conversation going. Also, as a reminder, that you can maximize your screen by clicking the double arrow button in the lower right corner of the slides. And yes, this virtual session is being recorded and will be available to view on demand this week. We'll send you a notification as soon as it's ready. Now let's get started. Over to you, Sumit. Thank you, Jeff. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Sumit Keswani, and I will be talking about planning to deploy our MyJordi cluster to the cloud. So you may be moving an on-prem cluster or setting up a new cluster in the cloud. And there are several design and operational considerations that will come into play. Um, you know, some of these are um, you know, cost, uh, which industry you're in, or which expertise you have, uh, in which cloud platform. Um, and there may be a personal preference too. Um, after that, you know, there will be some operational cons uh, considerations like VM and cluster sizing, uh, what Vertica mode do you want to uh, deploy Eon or Enterprise uh, depends on your use case. Uh, what are the DevOps skills available? Um, you know, what elasticity separation uh, you need? Uh, you know, what is your backup and DR strategy? What, what do you want in terms of high availability? Um, and you will have to think about, you know, how much data you have and where it's going to live. And in, in order to understand the cost or um, the, the, the cost and the benefit of this deployment, you will have to understand the access patterns and how you're moving data from into the cloud. So things to consider um, before you move a, a deployment, a vertical deployment to the cloud, right, is, is one thing to keep in mind is Virtual CPUs or CPUs in the cloud are not the same as the usual CPUs that you've been uh, familiar with in your data center. Uh, a vCPU is half of a CPU because of hyper-threading. There is definitely the noisy neighbor effect. Uh, there is, depending on what other things are hosted in the cloud environment, you may see performance, um, uh, you may occasionally see performance issues. There are I.O. limitations um, on the instances that you provision. Uh, so that what that really means is you can't always scale up. You might have to scale out. Uh, basically, you have to have more instances rather than getting bigger or the right size instances. Um, finally, uh, there is, uh, there is uh, an important distinction here. Virtualization is not free. There can be a significant overhead to virtualization. It could be as much as 30%. So when you size and scale your clusters, uh, you must keep that in mind. Uh, uh, now, the other important aspect is, you know, where you put your um, where you put your vertical cluster is important. The choice of the region, how far it is from your various um, office locations, um, where will the data live? with respect to the cluster. And remember, popular locations can fill up. So if you want to scale out, uh, additional capacity may or may not be available. Uh, so these are things you have to uh, keep in mind when picking or choosing uh, your um, cloud platform and your um, deployment. So at this point, I want to make a plug for Eon Mode. Uh, Eon Mode is the latest mode, uh, is, is, is a cloud mode for Vertica. It has been designed with cloud economics in mind. Uh, it uses shared storage, which is durable, available, and very cheap, like S3 storage or Google Cloud storage. Um, it has been designed for quick scaling, like scale out, and highly elastic deployments. 
It has also been designed for high workload isolation where each um, application or user group can be isolated from the other one so that they can be built and uh, uh, monitored separately without affecting each other. Um, but there are some disadvantages or perhaps um, you know, there's a cost to using Eon mode. Uh, act storage in S3 is neither cheap nor, nor efficient. Uh, so there's a high latency of I.O. when accessing data from S3. There is API and ac data access cost. There is API and data access cost uh, associated with uh, accessing your data in S3. Um, Vertica in Eon mode has the pay-as-you-go model, which you know works for some people and does not work for others. So therefore, it is important to uh, keep that in mind. And performance can be a little bit variable here because it depends on cache. Um, it depends on the local people, which is a cache. Um, and it is not as predictable as um, E mode. So that's, that's another trade off. So let's uh, spend about a minute uh, and see how a Vertica cluster in Eon mode looks like. Uh, a Vertica cluster in Eon mode has S3 as the durability layer where all the data sits. There are subclusters which are essentially just execution groups, uh, which is separated compute, uh, which will service different workloads. So, for in this example, you may have two subclusters: one uh, servicing ETL workload, and the other one servicing some uh, These clusters are isolated and uh, they do not affect each other's performance. This allows you to scale them independently and isolate workloads. So this is the new Vertica Eon mode, which has been uh, specifically designed by us for use in the cloud. Um, but beyond this, you can use EE mode or Eon mode in the cloud. Um, it really depends on what your, um, what your, what your use case is, uh, but both of these are possible, and uh, we highly recommend Eon mode wherever possible. Okay, let's talk, uh, let's talk a little bit about what we mean by Vertica support in the cloud. Now, as you know, a cloud is a shared data center, right? Um, performance in the cloud can vary. It can vary between regions, availability zones, time of the day, choice of instance type, what concurrency you do you use, and of course, the noisy neighbor effect. Uh, you know, we in Vertica, we performance, load, and stress test uh, our product before every release. We have a bunch of use cases. We go through all of them, make sure that we haven't um, you know, regress any performance and make sure that it works at the standards and gives you the high performance that you've come to expect. However, your solution or your workload is unique to you, and it is still your responsibility to make sure that it is tuned appropriately. Uh, to do this, one of the easiest things you can do is, you know, pick, pick a tested operating system, allocate the virtual machine, you know, uh, with enough resources. Pick something that we recommend because we have tested it thoroughly. Um, it, it goes a long way in giving you a predictability. So after this, I would like to now go um, go into the various platforms, um, cloud platforms that Vertica has worked on, and uh, and I'll start with AWS. And my colleague Chris will speak about Azure and GCP, and and our path forward. So so without further ado, let's start with um, the. Amazon Web Services platform. So this is Vertica running on the Amazon Web Services platform. So as you probably are all aware, uh, Amazon Web Services is the market leader in this space. I mean, they really uh, are the biggest uh, provider by far um, and have been here for a very long time. Uh, and Vertica has deep integration in the Amazon Web Services space. Uh, we've been, we've ha we provide uh, a marketplace offering which has both pay-as-you-go or a bring-your-own-license model. Um, we've, we have many, um, you know, knowledge-based articles, best practices, scripts, and resources that help you configure and use a Vertica uh, database in the cloud. Several, um, we have several customers in the cloud for many, many years now. We have uh, management console-based point-and-click deployments, uh, you know, for ease of use in the cloud. So Vertica has a, a deep integration in the Amazon space and. Uh, and has been there for quite a bit now. So we've accumulated a lot of uh, experience here. So let's talk about um, sizing on AWS. Well, sizing on any platform comes down to 
you know, these four or five different things. Um, it comes down to picking the right instance type, uh, picking the right uh, disk volume and type, uh, tuning and optimizing your networking, and uh, finally, you know, some operational concerns like uh, security, maintainability, and backup. So let's uh, go into each one of these on the AWS um, ecosystem. So the choice, uh, the choice of instance type is one of the uh, important uh, choices that you will make. Uh, in Eon mode, uh, you know, you don't really need a persistent disk. Um, you can you should probably choose a firmware disk uh, because uh, it gives you extra speed and it's and it's free with the instance type. Uh, we we highly recommend the i three four x instance types, which are very economical, have a big uh, four terabyte D four cache per node. Um, the i three metal uh, series is uh, is is similar to the i three four, but has got uh, si significantly better performance uh, for for those subclusters that need this extra oomph. Um, the i3.2 is, is good for scale out of small ad hoc clusters. You know, they have a smaller cache and lower performance, but it's, it's cheap enough to use very indiscriminately. Uh, if you were in EE mode, well, we don't use S3 as the layer of durability in EE. Uh, your local volumes are the, are the, is where we persist the data. Hence, you do need an EBS volume um, in EE mode. Uh, in order to make sure that um, uh, you know the, the the instance or the deployment is manageable. You might have to use some sort of a software RAID uh, array um, over the EBS volumes. The most common instance type we see in EE mode is the R44x, the C4, or the M4 instance types. And of course, uh, for temp space and depot, we always recommend instance volumes. They're just much faster. Um, So um, let's go to let's talk about optimizing your network or tuning your network. Uh, for for the best the best thing you can do about tuning your network, especially in Eon mode, but in other modes too, is to get a VPC ST endpoint. This is essentially a routing rule that that um, makes sure that all traffic between your cluster and S3 goes over an internal uh, internal fabric. Uh, this makes it much faster. You don't pay for egress uh, costs. Uh, especially if you're doing external tables or 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 your communal storage, um, but you do need to create it. Uh, many times people will forget doing it, um, so it, you really do have to create it. And and best of all, it's free. It doesn't cost you anything extra. You just have to create it during cluster creation time, and um, and there's a significant performance difference for using it. So the next uh, the next thing about tuning your network uh, is you know sizing it correctly. Pick the closest geographical region um, to your uh, to where you'll consume the data. Pick the right um, availability zone. We highly recommend using cluster placement groups. In fact, they are required for the stability of the cluster. Uh, a cluster placement group is essentially AWS's notion of a rack. Um, uh, Nodes in a cluster placement group are, you know, physically closer to each other than they would otherwise be, and this allows, you know, a 10 Gbps um, bidirectional TCP/IP flow between the nodes, and and um, this makes sure that you know you you get high amount of commits per second. Uh, as you probably are all aware, uh, the cloud does not support broadcast or UDP broadcast, uh, hence you must use point-to-point -point UDP. Um, in, uh, for spread in, in, in the cloud or in AWS. Um, beyond that, um, you know, UDP does not, point to point UDP does not scale very well beyond 20 nodes. So, you know, as your cluster size is increased, you must uh, switch over to large cluster mode. And finally, um, uh, use instances with uh, enhanced networking or SRIOB um, support. Again, it's free. Um, it comes with the choice of the instance type and the operating system. Uh, we highly recommend it. Um, it makes a big difference in terms of how the workload will perform. Uh, uh, so let's talk a little bit about security, configuration, and uh, orchestration. As I said, we provide um, cloud formation scripts to um, 
to make the ease of deployment. You can use the MC point and click. Um, with regard to security, um, you know, Vertica will suppose, will does support instance profiles out of the box in Amazon. Uh, we recommend you use it. Um, this is uh, this is highly desirable so that you are not passing access and access keys and secret keys around. Uh, if you use our marketplace image, we have picked the latest operating systems. Um, we have patched them. Uh, Amazon actually validates everything on marketplace. Uh, it scans them for security vulnerabilities, so you get that for free. Uh, we do some basic configuration, like we disable root SSH access, we disallow any password access, uh, we turn on uh, encryption, and we run a basic set of security checks to make sure that the image is is uh, is, is uh, secure. Of course, it, it could be made more secure, but we try to balance out uh, security, performance, and convenience. And finally, let's talk about uh, backups. Um, especially in Neon mode, I get the question, you know, do we really need to back up our system since the data is on S3? Um, and the answer is yes, you do, because you know, uh, uh, S3 is not going to protect you against an accidental drop table. Um, you know, S3 has a finite amount of reliability, durability, and availability, and you may want to have um, be able to restore data differently. Uh, also, backups are um, are important if you're if you're doing DR or if you have a um, additional cluster in a different region. Um, the other cluster can be considered a backup. Um, and finally, you know, why not uh, create a backup or a disaster uh, recovery cluster? You know, ba ba uh, storage is cheap in, in the cloud, so you know we we highly recommend uh, you use it. Um, so with this, I would like to um, hand it over to my colleague, Christopher uh, Gilly, who will talk about um, the other two platforms that we support, that is uh, Google and Azure. Um, over to you, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Smeet, and hi, everyone. So while there's no argument that you know we here at Vertica have a long history of running uh, within the Amazon Web Services space, there are uh, other alternative cloud service providers where we do have a presence, such as uh, Google Cloud Platform, or uh, GCP. For those of you who are unfamiliar with GCP, it's considered the third largest cloud service provider in the market space, and it's priced very competitively to its peers. It has a lot of similarities to AWS in the products and services that it offers, but it tends to be the go-to place for newer businesses or startups. We officially started supporting GCP a little over a year ago with our first entry into their GCP marketplace. It's a solution that deployed a fully functional and ready to use enterprise mode cluster. We followed up on that with the release and the support of uh, uh, Google Storage Buckets. And now I'm extremely pleased to announce that with the launch of Vertica 10, we're officially supporting Eon mode architecture in GCP as well. But that's not all, as we're adding additional offerings into our GCP into the GCP marketplace. With the launch of version 10, we'll be introducing a second listing in the marketplace that allows for the deployment of a neon mode cluster that's all being driven by our own management consult. This will allow customers to quickly spin up eon-based uh, clusters within the GCP space. And if that wasn't enough, I'm also pleased to tell you that very soon after the launch, we're going to be offering uh, Vertica by the hour in GCP as well. And while we've done a lot to automate the solutions uh, coming out of the marketplace, we recognize the simple fact that for a lot of you, building your, uh, your cluster manually is really the only option. So with that in mind, let's talk about the things you need to understand in GCP to get that done. So I'm wondering if you think the slide looks familiar. Well, nope, it's not an erroneous duplicate slide from Sumit's AWS section. It's merely an acknowledgment of all the things you need to consider for running Vertic in the cloud. In Vertica, the choice of the operational mode will dictate some of the choices you'll need to make in the infrastructure, particularly around storage. Just like on-prem solutions, you'll need to understand the disk and networking capacities to get the most out of your cluster. And one of the most attractive things in GCP is the pricing, as it tends to run a little less than the others, but it does translate into less choices and options within the environment. If nothing else, I want you to take one thing away from this slide, and Samit said this earlier. 
VMs running about AWS, Meet said this about AWS earlier, uh, VMs running in the GCP space run on top of hardware that has hyper-threading enabled, and that a, a vCPU doesn't equate to a core, but rather a processing thread. This becomes particularly important if you're moving from an on-prem environment into the cloud, because a physical Vertica node with 32 cores is not the same thing as a VM with 32 vCPUs. In fact, with 32 vCPUs, you're only getting about 16 cores worth of performance. GCP does offer a handful of VM types, which they categorize by letter. But for us, most of these don't make great choices for Vertica nodes. The N series, however, does offer a good core to memory ratio, especially when you're looking at the high mem variants. Also, keep in mind, performance in I.O., uh, such as network and disk, are partially dependent on the VM size. So customers in GCP space should be focusing on 16 vCPU VMs and above for their Vertica nodes. Disk options in GCP can be broken down into two basic types, persistent disks and local disks, which are ephemeral. Persistent disks come in two forms, standard or SSD. For Vertica and Eon mode, we recommend that customers use persistent SSD disks for the catalog and either local SSD disks or persistent SSD disks uh, for the depot and the temp space. A couple of things to think about here though. Persistent disks are pre provisioned as a single device with a settable size. Local disks are provisioned as multiple disk devices with a fixed size, requiring you use to requiring you to use some kind of software rating to create a single storage device. So while local SSD disks provide much more throughput, you're using CPU resources to maintain, the res the, maintain that RAID set. So you're giving it, it's a little bit of a trade-off. Persistent disks offer redundancy with, with, uh, either within the zone they exist or within the region. And if you're selecting regional redundancy, the disks are replicated across multiple zones in the region. Um, this does have an effect in the performance of the VM, so we don't recommend this. Uh, what we do is recommend is the, uh, the zonal redundancy when you're using persistent disks, as it gives you that redundancy level without actually affecting the performance. Uh, remember also, in the cloud space, all I.O. is network I.O., as disks are basically block storage devices. This means that disk actions can and will slow down network traffic. Uh, and finally, uh, the storage bucket access in GCP is based on GCP interoperability mode, which means that it's basically compliant with the AW, uh, AWS uh, S3 API. In interoperability mode, access to the bucket is granted by a key pair that GCP refers to as HMAC keys. HMAC keys can be generated for individual users or for service accounts. Um, we will recommend that when you're creating HMAC keys, Choose a service account to ensure that the keys are not tied to a single employee. When thinking about storage for enterprise mode, things change a little bit. We still recommend persistent SSD disks over standard ones. Uh, however, the use of local SSD disks for anything other than temp space is highly discouraged. I said it before, local SSD disks are ephemeral, meaning that the data is lost if the machine is turned off or goes down. So not really a place you want to store your data. In GCP, multiple persistent disks placed into a software RAID set does not create more throughput like you can find in other clouds. The I.O. Uh, saturation usually hits the VM uh, limit long before it hits the disk limit. In fact, performance of uh, persistent disks is determined not just by the size of the disk, but also by the size of the VM. So a good rule of thumb in GCP is to maximize your I.O. throughput uh, for persistent disks. It's that the, uh, the size tends to max out at two terabytes for uh, SSDs and 10 terabytes for standard disks. Network performance in GCP can be thought of in two distinct ways. There's node-to-node -node traffic, and then there's egress traffic. Node-to-node -node performance in GCP uh, is really good within the zone, uh, with typical traffic between nodes falling in the 10 to 15 gigabits per second range. This might vary a little from zone to zone and region to region, but usually it's only limited, uh, or only uh, limited by the existing traffic that the, uh, where the VMs exist. So kind of a noisy neighbor effect. 
Uh, egress traffic from uh, a VM, however, is subject to throughput caps, um, and these are based on the size of the VM. So the speed is set uh, for the number of vCPUs in the VM at 2 gigabits per second per vCPU and tops out at 32 gigabits per second. So the larger the VM, the more vCPUs you get, the larger the cap. So some things to consider in the networking space for your Vertica cluster. Pick a region that's physically close to you. Um, even if you're connecting to the GCP network from a corporate LAN as opposed to the internet, the further the packets have to travel, the longer it's going to take. Uh, also, GCP, like most clouds, doesn't support UDP broadcast traffic on their virtual networking, so you do have to use the point-to-point -point flag uh, for spread when you're creating your cluster. Um, and since the network cap on, on uh, VMs is set at 32 gigabits per second per VM, maximize your network uh, egress throughput and don't use VMs that are smaller than 16 vCPUs for your Vertica nodes. And that gets us to the one question I get asked the most often. How do I get my data into and out of the cloud? Well, GCP offers many different methods uh, to support different speeds and different price points for uh, data in ingress and, and egress. There's the obvious one, right? Across the internet, either directly to the VMs or into the storage bucket, or you can you know, light up a VPN tunnel to encrypt all that traffic. But additionally, GCP offers direct network interconnects from your corporate network. These get provided either by Google or by a partner, and they vary in speeds. Um, they also offer things called direct or carrier peering, which is connecting the edges of the networks uh, between your network and GCP. And you can use uh, CDN interconnects, which creates, I believe, an on-demand connection uh, from the GCP network to your, your network to the GCP network uh, provided by a large host of uh, CDN service providers. So GCP offers a lot of uh, ways to move your data around uh, in, in and out of the GCP cloud. It's really a matter of what price point works for you and what technology uh, your corporation is looking to use. So we've talked about AWS. We've talked about GCP. It really only leaves one more cloud. So last, and by, but uh, by far not the least, there's the Microsoft Azure environment. Holding on strong to the number two place in the major cloud providers, Azure offers a very robust cloud offering that's attractive to customers that already consume services from Microsoft. But what you need to keep in mind is that the underlying foundation of their cloud is based on the, Windows, on the Microsoft Windows products. And this makes their cloud offering a little bit different in the services and offerings that they have. The good news here, though, is that Microsoft has done a very good job of getting their virtualization drivers baked into the modern kernels of most Linux operating systems making running Linux-based VMs in Azure fairly seamless. So here's the slide again, but now you're going to notice uh, uh, some slight differences. First off, in Azure, we only support enterprise mode. This is because the Azure storage product is very different from Google Cloud Storage and S3 on AWS. And so while we're working, in, working on getting this supported and we're starting to focus on this, we're just not there yet. This means that since we're only supporting enterprise mode in Azure, getting the local disk performance right is one of the keys to success of running Vertica here, with the other major key uh, being making sure that you're getting the appropriate networking speeds. Overall, Azure is a really good platform for Vertica, and its performance and, and pricing are very much on par with AWS. But keep in mind that the newer versions of the Linux operating systems like RHEL and CentOS run much better here than the older versions. OK, so first things first again, just like GCP, in Azure, VMs are running uh, on top of hardware that has hyper-threading enabled. Um, and because of the way of uh, Hyper-V, uh, Azure's virtualization engine works, you can actually see this, right? So if you look down into the CPU information of the, the VM, you'll actually see how it groups the vCPUs by core and by thread. Azure offers a lot of VM types and is adding new ones all the time. Um, but for us, we see three VM types that make the most sense for Vertica. For customers that are looking to run production workloads in Azure, the ESV3 and the LSV2 series are the two main recommendations. While they differ slightly in the CPU uh, to memory ratio and the IO throughput, 
the VSV3 uh, series is probably the best recommendation for a generalized Vertica node, with the LSV2 series being recommended for workloads with higher I.O. requirements. If you're just looking to deploy a sandbox environment, uh, the DSV3 series is a very suitable choice that really can uh, reduce your overall cloud spend. VM storage in Azure is provided by a grouping of four different types of disks, all offering different levels of performance. Uh, introduced at the end of last year, the UltraDisk option is the highest performing disk type for VMs in Azure. It was designed for database workloads where high throughput and low, la la uh, low latency is very desirable. However, the UltraDisk uh, option is not available in all regions yet, although that's been changing slowly since their launch. The premium SSD option, which has been around uh, for a while and is widely available, can also offer really nice performance, especially at high, higher capacities. Uh, and just like other cloud providers, the I.O. throughput you get on VMs uh, is dictated not only by the size of the disk, but also by the size of the VM and its type. So a good rule of thumb here, VM types with an S will have a much better throughput rate than, than, uh, than ones that don't, meaning and the larger VMs will have you know, higher I.O. throughput than the smaller ones. Um, you can expand uh, the VM disk throughput by using multiple disks in Azure and using a software RAID. Uh, this overcomes the limitations of single disk performance, but keep in mind you're now using CPU cycles to maintain that RAID, so it is a bit of a trade-off. Um, the other nice thing in Azure is that all their managed disks are encrypted by default on the server side, so there's really nothing you need to do here to enable that. And, of course, I mentioned this earlier, there is no native access to Azure Storage yet, but it is something we're working on. We have seen folks using third-party applications like Minio to access Azure Storage in an S3 bucket, so it might be something you'll want to keep in mind and maybe even test out for yourself. Networking in Azure comes in two different flavors, standard and accelerated. Uh, in standard networking, the entire network stack is abstracted and virtualized. So this works really well. However, there are performance limitations. Standard networking tends to top out, top out around four gigabits per second. Accelerated networking in Azure is based on single root IO virtualization of the Mellanox adapter. This is basically the VM talking directly to the physical network card uh, in the host hardware and it can produce uh, network speeds up to 20 gigabits per second, so much, much faster. Keep in mind, though, that not all VM types and operating systems actually support accelerated networking. And you know, just like disk throughput, network throughput is based on VM type and size. So what do you need to think about for networking in the Azure space? Again, stay close to home. Pick regions that are geographically close to your location. Yes, the backbones between the regions are very, very fast, but the more hops your packets have to make, the longer it takes. Azure offers two types of groupings with, uh, of their VMs, availability sets and availability zones. Availability zones offer good redundancy across multiple zones, but this actually increases the node-to-node -node latency, so we recommend you avoid this. Availability sets, on the other hand, keep all your VMs grouped together within a single zone, but make sure that no two VMs are running on the same host hardware for redundancy. And just like the other clouds, UDB broadcast is not supported, so if you have point, to, you have to use the point-to-point -point flag uh, uh, when you're creating your database to ensure that the spread works properly. Um, spread timeout, okay, this is a good one. So recently, Microsoft has uh, started monthly rolling updates of their environment. What this looks like is VMs running on top of hardware that's receiving an update can be paused. And this becomes problematic when the pausing of the VM exceeds eight seconds as the unpaused members of the cluster now think that the paused VM is down. So consider adjusting the spread timeout uh, for your clusters in Azure to 30 seconds, and this will help avoid a little of that. If you're deploying a large cluster in Azure, more than 20 nodes, Use large cluster mode, as point-to-point -point, uh, for spread doesn't really scale well with a lot of vertical nodes. And finally, you know, pick VM types and operating systems that support accelerated networking. The difference in the node-to-node -node speeds can be very dramatic. 
So how do we move data around in Azure, right? So Microsoft used views data egress a little differently uh, than other clouds as it classifies any data being transmitted by a VM as egress. However, it only builds for data egress that actually leaves the Azure environment. Egress speed limits in Azure are based entirely on the uh, VM type and size, and then they're limited by your connection to them. Uh, while not offering as many pathways uh, to access their cloud as GCP, Azure does offer a direct network-to-network -network, uh, connection called ExpressRoute, offered by a group of a large group of third-party processors uh, partners. The um, ExpressRoute offers multiple tiers of performance that are based on a flat charge for inbound data and a metered charge for outbound data. And of course, you can still access these via the internet and securely through a VPN gateway. So on behalf of Jeff, Sumit, and myself, I'd like to thank you for listening to our presentation today. And we're now ready for Q&A.